So welcome to the show. Today we're joined by two legends of local football. Firstly, Jim Magilton, and secondly, George Skin Little. Welcome to the show, lads. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for putting me second the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get used to that, George. Yes. <laughs> well, at least I mentioned you. I forgot to mention my good friend, Jerry Flynn. Sorry about that, Jim. <laughs> good to see you again, Colin. <clears throat> I should have said there, Jerry and I are joined. Sorry about that, lads. Okay, so Jim, over to you. I mean, you've got a well-documented career, starting at Liverpool, and as Jared tells me, you tell, you tell him every day, QPR, Southampton. So you take it away. Tell me a bit about yourself, big man. 16, I left, I left uh, Belfast at 16, first plane I'd ever been on, and uh, went to Liverpool, and at the height of them winning everything, look at Flynn. Flynn's actually getting lower in the seat, isn't he? <laughs> were the team. So one week match a day, next week uh, they're in the building, seeing all the top, top players, Kenny Douglas player manager, uh, going straight into that environment uh, was just, it was surreal. Honestly, it was one of those unbelievable experiences. I think it took me about six months to realise I'm at Liverpool, I'm playing, I'm part of the club. Uh, and I'd left, I'd left Belfast in a good place. You know, I was in, I was playing for Distillery. A lot of the lads, uh, we'll know Tommy McDonald's, Jim McFadden's, the Damien Grants, all the headbangers. Uh, and we were in, a, I was in a, a team that were winning. So, in a fantastic setup with a, a really good manager at a club, Roy Walsh had given him a debut. So, I was in a really good place leaving. And going there was just a fantastic opportunity for me. And, uh, and I enjoyed it immensely. Being part of that club during that spell was just tremendous. I was going to Wembley. I was, you know, I was watching Liverpool win league titles. I watched them lose a league title to the Arsenal. I was there during Hillsborough. You know, all those things that just gave me this fantastic apprenticeship in the game. And, and really that education helped me to go on and have a career in the game. And then, you, yeah, I think you'd gone to Oxford after, isn't that right? Yeah, I was playing in the reserves and playing out in the skin. Pardon the pun. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and thinking, next step for me is first team. I remember getting the call. Kenny wanted to see me come into the office. I'm thinking, how do I get my mom and dad over? How do I get my mates over? I'm going to make some phone calls here. And he just dropped the bombshell. He said, right, listen, we've accepted a bid. Oxford United have bid 100 grand. Do you know the way to Oxford? No. He said, well, you're going to need to find out because you're playing West Ham on Tuesday night. And that was kind of way it. So from having that unbelievable experience to the real low of my career at Liverpool's over. I'm never going to play in the first team. And away I went. So the, tra the journey down to, to Oxford nearly killed me. Honestly, I was in my wee blue Ford Escort, black bin liners, my whole life in the back seats, and going, going to start a, really going to start my professional career. And again, I was very lucky, very, very lucky to get a manager who trusted me and had confidence in me. And right away, boom, hit the ground running. West Ham away, Tuesday night, under the lights, Upton Park, frightening, loved it. And I just knew then that I had a chance then to earn a living in the game. That was the first real night, and it hit me that this is a job now. This is, this is my, hopefully, the start of my career. Who was the manager then? Was it Jim Smith? Brian Horton. Brian Horton. Brian Horton was the manager. He'd seen me play. Spent a few, the didn't have much money then. It was the Maxwell era. And they managed to find a few quid. And the rest, really, that going there and playing in the championship, it was Division Two at the time, was just fantastic. Big, big clubs in it. Uh, and it was a realization that this is, this is a level where I'm, I'm being pitched at. Reserve team football never replicates it. The lads will tell you, it never, ever replicates the feeling of a three o'clock on a Saturday or 7.30 on a Tuesday night. You know, it's never rep because you, you're you you're you're part of a team then that's trying to win games and there's repercussions. You're actually in the middle of it. You've got to start winning games. You've got to you know really produce. No hiding place. We talk about it a lot with the kids. Once you cross over the white line, you have to take responsibility. So all these things kind of way we're going through in my mind. But uh, without the education, without that apprenticeship at Liverpool, I don't think I would have made it. I honestly, don't. Brilliant. But Oxford must have had a few cuts because you got a name, your, a car with your name up beside it, if I remember rightly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I stuck it on <laughs> with a blow dryer. Not that Jared would know anything about blow dryers. 
But uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, no. Listen, I, I I had a brilliant time there. Steve McLaren was there, Paul Simpson was there, Steve Foster was there, Andy Melville, Paul Key was there, uh, Mickey Lewis, Dave Penny, there were lots of good Les Phillips, lots of really good players, good pros. And again, I walked in from a Liverpool environment where you know that unbelievable winning mentality to not winning many games, but after it was all scrap. And we always had to play tooth and nail to remain in the division. So from one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, it was it was every year was always about a test of character, and it showed. Uh, it gave me an insight into me, right? And what, what had I got the mental strength to be able to deal with it and then kick on? And then I was lucky, you know, Southampton came in and gave me an opportunity in the Premier League. Brilliant, brilliant. And Jared Little, you left these shores and went the, the best team in the world. Isn't that right, Jared? Yes, Colin, I did. Uh, I, didn't didn't know you, I didn't know you signed for United, Scott. <laughs> 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 Absolutely <laughs> fact, Jared. I didn't. It was too, too small a club compared to Celtic, you know, back then. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, like Jim, you know, left at 16. Um, played for Star Sea, Sam Cross and Star Sea. Went to Celtic, 16 years of age. Uh, pretty much first time being away from home. I uh, was there for, I think it was about eight, eight months before I was able to get back and visit family and stuff. So it was, it was, it was hard, um, very hard at the start, but getting used to, you know, once you get settled in, Jim will tell you, it's, a, it's the best place ever when you're, when you're playing and enjoying and meeting new friends and, you know, being coached and, and all the rest of it. So, um, and, and total, I think I was there for about five years. Uh, didn't get the opportunity to play first team, obviously. Um, youth team and, and reserve team um, was the first I got. Uh, worked under um, Willie McStay for the large part of it. Tommy Burns, uh, who was unbelievable, you know. And Tommy Tommy Burns, uh, God rest him, was 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 really really good for for any kids breaking through. He really spent an awful lot of time on youth, um, helping develop them and and, and nurture them and, and things like that. So. Uh, you know, and people often ask, you know, when you, when you, as a coach or a manager, you know, who the best managers you've worked under, or who's the, who would you sort of look at and, and take things from? And, and definitely Tommy Burns and, and back then William McStay were, were brilliant for me. Um, but it became a sort of stage like like Jim, you know, where there's questions sort of asked: Are you are you going to be playing the first team? Are you going to, are you good enough to play in the first team? And at that stage, I was I was playing under 21 international football for Northern Ireland, and Jimmy Quinn, uh, Jim would have played with him, did you, Jim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Quinn came in and helped um, helped out with the, the campaign and the 21 campaign, and liked me and, and uh, him and Barry Fry uh, offered me a, a, a good contract down at Peterborough. Um, again, it was a big thing because you're away first first time away from home. You knew nothing else when he's Scotland, really, in, in the football sort of circle. And to make that jump as a young 19-year-old, to go down there and pack up and it was very daunting. Um, but i done it. Uh, I didn't have much luck uh, in terms of playing. I, I got injury after injury. I had one, one sort of competitive game in the first team in, in a cup match. And funny enough, it was against Reading. Tommy Burns was a manager at the time. Good. Hockey boner. And uh, I'd done really well and then get injured again and just it didn't work out. So after two years, I, I, I just decided that I wanted to come home and try and um, play Irish League football and, and enjoy my football again and be happy. And that's what happened. I, I remember thinking when you were young, I, I'd found you. We were playing football one night and uh, I was a Clivemall youth team at the time. And I'm doing, I said, that kid can play. I said, son, I get you up to Clivemall. We turned turn around and laughed and said, He's at Celtic, Simba. Bally under the legs. Oh, that's right. You and your Paul, Paul Little, absolutely brilliant. All All right. Right ones. Jerry, George's uh, story will resonate with you, going away and, and, and having to come back. Difficult time. Yeah, I was just when he was saying when he left Celtic there, one of the directors gave him a, a business card. <laughs> uh, what do you call him, Scott? Fergus McCann. Fergus McCann. <laughs> 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 the director was an owner. Uh, yeah. We got a wee turn out of it in a bar. Oh, and, uh, I, I look like we Fergus <laughs> now in a baldy head. Uh, yeah, it's good. Do you remember the time I was just give us that business card out of your wallet? We got a wee turn out of it in a, br- a bar in the Bronx. Oh, well, no, brilliant. We, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll probably talk about some of those stories after, but 
one of the one of the stories we we went to America. I was only eighteen, I still at Celtic, and uh, we, we went over. We were skint, and we were in the bar, and, and uh, but nothing we, changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know, um, but, but Jerry goes, "None is that. None is that." We uh, business card took it. Jerry didn't have a clue. And Kieran and I was standing at the bar, skint, sipping over a bottle of beer. And um, next minute, Jerry disappears for about five, ten minutes, comes back and goes, right, here's the plan. Just wave. See, once a DJ mentions your name, just turn around and give a wave. And that's all you need to do. <laughs> and of course, hadn't a clue what was going on. Jerry had went up, boxed the DJ off. We were Celtic stars. We were this. He was looking after us and he had a few quid. Um, that night, I'm not, no joke, didn't have to put a hand in their pocket. Everyone <laughs> Superstar Celtic player. And, he, and, player. and, he, and, and he's been going back ever since. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I'll tell you the name of the band. The name of the band was called The Whole Shebang. They're still playing in New York at the minute. And I'd give them the business card. But Rusty was with us. He was an American with Ginger Hur, And he was quite chubby at the time. So I said, look, there you are. Can you get sing a, a song for the three Glasgow Celtic players over at the bar? The next thing, uh, there was four of us. Rusty says, why didn't you say I played for Celtic? I says, look at you, you've ginger hair, look at the size of you, you're a raging. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a night we had, we had free drink for about three hours. Oh, that's class. Absolutely brilliant. So, <laughs> back to what we were saying there about uh, coming home. I mean, I know you guys are running this uh, elite uh, performance program, the IFA, and one of the things you're trying to do is uh, teach the kids, you know, what's going to happen when you go across the water. So Jared, Jared Flynn, you tell me, tell me about your story coming back and maybe resonate with, with skin. Um, again, I, I, could, I could have went on to Scunthorpe or I think York at the time, but um, I just wanted to get back. And again, I've spoke to you about this on, on different things, but uh, my thing was a confidence. You know, I, I just, I always didn't think I was good enough to be there with the English kids where they went home at the weekends and stuff. I was always stuck in digs, but um, I don't know. It was only... But I probably turned 30. I'm saying to myself what I knew and what I gathered over playing maybe four or five hundred games in the Irish League where I thought, you know, I actually probably could have stayed and make it, made a living out of it. But uh, at the time, I was just glad. I was, I was glad to get back. I, uh, fitness-wise and stuff, I was, there was nobody fitter than me at the club, but I just I lacked a few things to maybe, you know, go on and play in the first team and stuff. So, but in saying that, as I say, it was, I, I put it back to you. I wish I had a... Knowing them, what I know now, I probably would have stayed in England a wee bit longer. So it's, it's obviously been a regret. What about you, Skin? Do you regret coming back? Yeah, absolutely. Again, when I was at Peterborough, I was um, had a couple of opportunities of going elsewhere. I was at Northampton for a couple of weeks, and like Jim and I talk about this an awful lot. And in football, it's, it's all about timing and luck. And at the time I, I was up two weeks, I thought I got myself a move to um, Northampton and um, Kevin Wilson was actually caretaker manager, again, another player Jim would have played with. And uh, it was basically a trial really for two weeks and I'd done really well, played two games, one against Norwich and one against Ipswich, trained with the first team, uh, done really well. Kevin liked me and, and basically said, look, we're going to sign you. Um, so I had to go back to, to Peterborough, speak to Barry Fry, everything was going smoothly it's great and uh Kevin phones me the night before saying look bad news uh, the chairman because I'm only caretaker manager he won't let me send anyone uh, until I get the job obviously full time and he didn't get the job in the end but uh I think if I had a send he probably would have got the job because I'd have took him to another level but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the worst part. you were the reason he didn't get the job <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually done my pro license with Kevin. Yeah, we done a pro license in two thousand and nine. Uh, yeah. I think he's actually an agent now. Um, I think oh, he is. He's an agent now. He so, was managing catering. He had a spell of catering as well. He was, right he was another one. He threw his he threw his money around like manhole covers. Right. Right then. So yes, Simba. Uh, that's that's what happened at, at there and and. Um, you know, I come back and I probably could have stuck it out another wee bit, but it's just, just like Jerry, you just you get this stage where, you know, you, you feel sorry for yourself, you're away from home, you're still young. You know, I didn't really have great, if I'm being honest, you know, great advice with things like that. And, and this is part of what we, Jim and I, are, are trying to do now is, is give our young lads, you know, all our experience that we, for good and bad, 
uh, that we went through as a young lad leaving here and, and, and basically put them in the right frame of mind going there and, and prepare them properly for you know what's going to lie ahead and and there's going to be it's a roller coaster you know Jim will tell you and it's 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 unbelievable you know you have so many ups and downs and probably more downs and ups at the start and and it's a mental thing that gets you through it and and hopefully now our young boys going across will be mentally prepared for for that, um, the life of being a, a footballer. Brilliant. And Jimmy, obviously, you, you didn't come home, so you haven't got that experience. You have to just imagine how no. you felt. I've no sympathy for them too at all. <laughs> 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 no, listen, there were, there were many occasions had I had got a phone call from home, I probably would have skipped. But there was always this determination in me not to be another statistic. There were so many good players. That was always in the back of my mind. Even prior to leaving, people were telling me, oh, you'll be home in a year or you'll be home in two years or... You know, and there was kind of way that negativity around it. Well, I wasn't going to let that affect me. Listen, you're always affected on a day-to-day -day basis in training. You'd be getting a bit of stick. And at Liverpool, you got some stick. You know, you had to be, and they always tested your metal every day. Every day at Liverpool, it was, I can't be better than you were the day before. That was the first thing that a coach said to me. And, it's, and again, it resonated completely with me. So there were occasions when I was that low. Honestly, and uh, and and you, the first thing is, you know, the security blanket of home, security blanket of your family, your mates, you know, all that kind of way. And, and when you look at where we are now today in terms of social media, a lot of our boys are nonstop on, you know, social media and Twitter and whatever else they're on, and they see their their mates out in the and they're enjoying, yet. And they want a piece of that. They actually want, they crave that more than they want, a, you know, a life in professional football. And we're constantly talking about, you know, the sacrifices you have to make, the discipline you have to show. It is a tough gig. You know, there were stats that came out last year, I think Premier League uh, clubs issued a stat around the boys that enter an academy, a Premier League academy, and actually go on and play in the first time is 0.01%. Right. The monies that the clubs are spending, the big boys, Premier League, are all spending on youth development. Yet, how many players are actually coming through the system? Yet, they won the World Cup at 17s and 19s, and you're starting to see, you know, Foden coming through, the boys at Chelsea coming through. You know, they're England are producing good players. You'd like to think so with the money they're spending, do you know, and and in terms of like the quality and hopefully the quality coaching they're getting. But we've always produced good players. We've always produced really, really good players. And we work on all I, those things, and it's the psychological element of it. It really is. It's the yeah. I, I think now, Jim, and I don't know if you agree, but I, I think it's, and that's said, it's easier for players now in terms of communicating with friends and family back home. Back then, we, I, I remember like, in I had to the day, send a pigeon. I, I, <laughs> I, had to, I had to go up to the phone box, I had to walk a mile to get to the phone box, yeah. with a bag of 20 peas to the phone yeah. home. And, and, you know, you had to try and you make sure you got enough to phone your mum and the rest was for your girlfriend. You always yeah. had to phone the girlfriend. I don't, yeah. you don't have that problem. You never had a check. <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> I, I, I had to split and I got my mom's as well. I was, I was trying to the 20s and, and <laughs> it, was, it was very early between who was going to phone home. But no, it's, it's true. Like we didn't have social media or anything like that. You know, either write a letter or, or, or make a phone call in the, in the, in the red phone boxes. And yeah. that was your, your way of communicating. Yeah, there's... Jerry, there's a lot of things now I talk about instant. Everything's instant. Instant success, instant gratification, instant reward. Instant mashed potato. Do you know what I mean? Instant call. You know, there's no time or thought. You know, it's everything wants it. People want it now. Yeah. When we growing up again, and I hated that when people said when I was growing up. And, but when we were growing up, we spent more time with the ball, yet we didn't know that. We had a ball all the time. Mm -hmm. Looking for you for your dinner, <laughs> you know. You were you were training, you were practicing under a lamppost, and it was constantly, constantly repetition, repetition, and physicality. You know, we were playing in the street, like we all reckon, remember we're playing in the street, and you all remember it could have been flipping fifteen SA, and the big boys. So the, the again the age range might have been from eighteen to twelve, and the twelve year olds had to move the ball quicker because the eighteen year olds would just take the ball off them. <laughs> thinking about that and people are talking about recreating streets street football but the street footballers we always had street footballers what we have to do now is just work on 
the the resilience we, we keep going it's it's having the mental fortitude to, to overcome the the hurdles that are going to be presented a lot of challenges for young players now yeah so you see, talking about communication i brought this sorry, up, sorry, go ahead i brought this up with lee finney the other day on the other podcast where lee was obviously a fantastic talent coming out of the irish league and when he found when he got to rangers Dick Avocat was nearly coaching that natural ability out of him mm. and wanted him to move the ball one, two touch where Lee's main asset when he was coming through, yeah. being able to run up players and dribble. Um, yeah. But the, the other thing that I was interested in asking you was, um, do you think it's easier from, if a player, if he plays Irish League and then goes a step across, they actually go in playing against men? Because when you do go across the academies, you're playing against kids, let's say, um, yeah. to 18, but you know, what you find is when you look at the last few players that have went across and made it, they've actually played in the Irish League first, playing against grown men, and then they haven't found it maybe as hard. If when actually, you know, uh, Gavin White, who's went in and went straight in first team and then got his move to Cardiff. You look at big Gareth McCauley, who had played, you know, boys like that where, you know, this, as you said, the stat coming home is something like 3% of boys who go across actually yeah. end up back with, home within one or two years. Yeah. And you've got you add Dallas to the mix, you add Segs to the mix. Boy, say. If, if we created if we created a pathway into if you could create a pathway into our Irish League clubs for young players, and let's be honest, it's only the last few years where there has been, you know, that intent from the clubs to create a youth development program, and that's not at being disrespectful to any because at the end of the day, the first team is your bread and butter. It is at any club, but particularly in the Irish League. And, and if they're successful, then you may be able to reinvest into your youth program. If you created a program that developed young players and you got into your first teams, of course, at 18 and 19, 20, you're better equipped to deal with all. You're more mature. You know, you're a man then, you're standing on your own two feet. You're, you've maybe had two or three years of playing senior football. I remember the 21s, Reese Marshall had played I think it was 250 or 300 games and won two Irish Cups. And I had another lad who won't be named. He hadn't played. I think he played one game in the first team and had played something like three games in three months, whilst Marshall had played 15 games or 16 games. So better equipped, fitness, you know, all those things that help you uh, make a name in the game. So if there was a pathway into our senior teams here, and the boys develop, then of course they're they're better equipped, one hundred percent. Because at sixteen to eighteen, the man that turned water into wine can't tell you if they're going to be footballers. Do you know? And, and that's again the same reasoning as in England, the same thoughts process. If you get one player through your academy, it's a justification of your academy. Do you know? So, uh, so yeah, I would I would love it if there was a pathway here too, but also recognise that. Our talented boys are going to leave at 16. If Manchester United, some of your boys, 16, Manchester United come knocking on the door, he's away. You're not going to stop him. I'd carry and, him, and Jim. Huh? I'd carry him. <laughs> but, if, you know, so, so that's not going to stop. You know what I mean? The best players are still going to go. On, on that point as well, um, yeah. from, from your thing, do you not think a kid would be better going to a lower league club? Instead of the prestige of going to a Liverpool, a Manchester United, a Celtic, a Rangers, you know, um, instead of going, if it's hard to turn down yeah. from your point of view, um, Liverpool. But if you had it went to Oxford, maybe at the start, yeah, you know, you, I may have played sooner. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's an argument again, that, Jim, isn't there? What's there's, that? There's two ways to look at that. There's, yeah. there's, there's a way to look at it with Jerry saying go to a lower league, but I, I think kids, if, if they go. Say if Man United, for example, and or even yourself, Jim, like Liverpool, and then had to drop down, you yeah. know, Liverpool to learn and, and, and yeah. play my man's football, and then go back yeah. up to a club like Southampton. You know, then it's you're, you're better equipped rather than there's an argument there if you go to a, a lower league club and mm -hmm. you know you're not getting the proper schooling because they're looking to, again to get it right and they're get the young lads or the, the man in there to win games quicker. And you don't get your opportunity, then the next step potentially quicker is home. Yeah, that's right. You know? And the other thing is, the other thing is that we 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 don't have any real involvement in where the club the kids go. You know, they come for, and ask for advice. One hundred percent, we give them advice. But the boys are still registered with their clubs here. 
the commentation goes straight to the clubs here. Do you know, what I mean? albeit we help develop the the boys here too, uh, and work in partnership with the clubs. The clubs, the clubs are kind of way they're, and and I often think that the clubs are their hands are tied behind their backs a little bit because sometimes the, the English or Scottish clubs will use the boy or the parents to you know make it make the clubs here make a, a decision around them and, and influence them and I think that's wrong at the end of the day the clubs need to deal in that come up with their deal do whatever they have to do and then the boy goes but the clubs here have a have a say, a major say or or a the only say uh, in, in where their boy goes do you know what I mean uh, and and it's a difficult one it really is a difficult one because we can't can't tell a boy not to go there at the end of the day, that's a decision the parents in the club make. Mm -hmm. That's see for the viewers. Just just tell us a wee bit more about the program itself and what you do and where you go and what happens to the lads. We're at Jordanstown, so we we selected Jordanstown. Uh, uh, they're full boarding. They're residents there. We have six or seven boys that we from across Northern Ireland uh, to schools in the Greater Belfast area. Uh, they come in on a Sunday and they stay there till. Thursday night is their last night, Friday morning, uh, and they train every day. And the, and the sessions are split between tactical sessions, pitch sessions, tactical sessions, and SC two, three times a week. So uh, we're trying to work on all the four pillars. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, there was a lot of readjustment for them. What the, the boys, I have to say, and the parents have bought into, the boys have been nothing short of sensational, you know. They, they, they're, they're up at Cord 8, they leave the dorms at Cord 8, uh, they get bussed uh, to the schools, uh, they then get picked up after school, and they're on the pitch for half four. And between half four and half six every day, the Thursday, they're, they're bang at it. And they've been superb, really, really good, bought into it, applied themselves, attitude's been terrific. And they get pushed, Jared and I uh, would be on the pitch with them, largely Jared, and we have other coaches who have done a splendid job of them. So, uh, on Friday, they return home. They'll play either Friday night for the club or Saturday morning, and then they're back at it again on the Sunday. So it's been a tough schedule for them. So it's largely like um, a Premiership Academy style approach? Well, it's an Academy style approach. It's these lads uh, an insight into what life's potentially like for them prior to leaving. We never had that. You know, we, 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 ran, away, we ran away, and it was kind of way learn on the job. You know, in survival of the fittest, these kids now are getting an insight into mommy and daddy are not making your beds. Do you know mommy and daddy won't be making your breakfast? Mommy and daddy will not be picking you up. Mommy and daddy will not be making your dinner. You know, your snacks. You know, all these sorts of things are very important for them because the moment again when they do go across, they're assessed right away. The first thing, and you only get one chance to make a first impression. The moment they walk into a club in England or Scotland, they'll be assessed. How are they communicate? Do they look up? Are they looking into your eyes? You know, are they how they dress? What way do they train? What what, what preparation they are? It, uh, does it take them to train? You know, what are they like after training? What was he like today? Is he moody? What was his attitude like? All the things and that and that just you know we're talking about football now, but that happens at every football club in the world. After every session, each player is assessed. He was rubbish at the time. Why, why was he rubbish? Go and find out. And Jared will talk about senior players. He used to drag you nuts. Absolutely bonkers. Because all you talked about was the players. That's all you talked about. But that's all that the youth team coach at a club in England or Scotland will, will do. They'll be assessing the lads the moment they walk in. So we want to give them the confidence and self-esteem uh, to walk in and handle it. Actually, life skills as much as about football, isn't it? One hundred percent. Absolutely. And sure, you, you touched earlier on, on communication and, and you rightly said that in our day there was no such thing as uh, you know, Facebook and that sort of stuff. It was pigeons, as Jimmy said. But you know, is that something you have to manage about their time spent on social media and the image and what they say? I know if you're, you're going for a conventional job now, the first thing an employer does is go into your Facebook page to see what sort of a lunatic you are. I mean, is that something that you manage? Well, it's, it's the same come on like the top scouts, the top clubs. Jim will tell you, uh, you know, it's not just about scouting a player now, it's about what his background is, is like. Um, you know, how, as you say, how, how often is he on social media? And when he is on social media, how does he conduct himself? 
Um, so that that's all took into every, every every like a proper report, you know. And it'll be I'll not be just like the last week of you know calm, calm garden on on Facebook and Twitter. It'll be the last year or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we 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 obviously. I mean, Jim Jim's constantly ramming down the, the young lads' throats, and really so that you know. And and now this is the best. Sorry, this is the best time that they've ever had to spend time on themselves. You know, away from their phones, the distractions of of day to day, getting out with their mates, doing whatever. The lockdown, you know, in a sense, has been a positive for some of our players because, you know, they have a ball, twenty four seven, near enough, out their back, out their front, in the park, on their own, whatever they're doing. Um, and and we try and say to the boy, look, don't be wasting your time on a phone or on a tablet or on a on the PlayStation, you know, it's some of our boys. We ask, you know, how often, you know, in a week would you be on a PlayStation? Even a day, mm-hmm. some of them are, are five hours, four hours a day on, on a PlayStation, which is which is a waste. You know, imagine converting that into three hours with a ball to your feet, mm-hmm. you know, up against the wall. As Jim says, it, that was natural to us growing up. You know, we naturally we couldn't wait. Our enjoyment was a ball, owning a ball, getting out, two lampposts. Two a say, one v one, two v two, five v eight, whatever it was, we would play it, and naturally we just get on with it. But now it's not. You've got the, the social media, you've got the PlayStation, you've got online, you've got everything. So there's there's massive distractions with young lads. So it's our job, Jim and I, and, and the coaches, to try and educate them in a sense that you know there is a time. Don't get me wrong, we don't want you to be permits all the time. You know, you've got to have a little bit of enjoyment in life, but. This is what you're going to be. You know, you're training to be a footballer, and if you're training to be a footballer, you got to act like it. You got to conduct yourself in the right manner. You got to put the practice in, the hours in, and everything else that goes along with it. You have to prepare yourself for it. So that's the type of education we're trying to give our our lads and prepare them mentally for going away. Brilliant. And the good thing about you two lads, you're, you're still really young. So the the Jim's the, not Jim's fifty one. Far away from Jim's you, and they're little, not like some old lad. He's fifty one, young. <laughs> What are you I'm saying? still the best player, Jim, Jared. You know Jim, it. Jim, 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 <laughs> did you not mention it? <laughs> 51 tomorrow. I look amazing. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, you know, your experience is absolutely invaluable to those kids and being able to say, look, you know, this is not what you can do, but this is what I've actually done. And here's what not to do. It, it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It sounds like an amazing program. And Jim, I, I think it was your, it was your idea. I was all my idea, don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, it is. It's oh, always it the, good, the great ideas are mine. <laughs> the ideas that you chuck in the waste bin is your man there. <laughs> I always, I was, yeah, great idea, Jared. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you what we did though. For four years, we waited and waited. Patience, and it's not one of my greatest virtues, but patience. UEFA had already gone to four other countries Belarus, Macedonia, Armenia, and A and other. And uh, and I waited and waited and waited, and then when I found out it was coming round again, I kind of battered down the door. And we were very fortunate. The two guys that we got were two football people. Amazingly, in UEFA, there's something like 400 uh, workers, and there's only about six or seven ex players. And we managed to get two of them. We managed to get them over. We managed to wine and dine. <laughs> <laughs> and we're quite good at that <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we managed to convince them and since then like the partnership's been brilliant Olivier comes over uh, and he has a really good time and he's so knowledgeable on the whole setup so you know we managed to secure Georgetown which was great we managed to work uh, we've got a great working environment you, you're starting to smell sweat which is good I always think about when I walk into an academy now, it's like a hotel reception. You, you don't you smell comfort, you don't smell sweat. You know, and, and, and if you want to be a player, you got to be hungry every single day. You got to be starving for it. You got to dog eat dog, stand on people's throats. I, I, when I got into that air arena, I, I could not wait. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to train. I couldn't wait, I couldn't wait to put it up, people. I just loved it. And... I want, you have to, to be a professional footballer, and again in this climate, that you got to smell it off you. You have to smell it off you. And as Jared pointed out, in this current climate, you're never going to get a better opportunity to consistently work with the ball and consistently work on your game. You have nothing else. You have no excuses. We're all in the same boat. So, so how do you choose the, the, the guys that make it through? Uh, 
that's again difficult given the resources we have within our department but try and get as many games as we can a lot of the boys have come through the program uh over a three four year period so we've been able to monitor them through that because they're always outsiders there's always late developers we've got one Dale Taylor was a late developer for us, who's now going to go to Nottingham Forest, who came through late, started in the programme, but kind of way disappeared, as young players do, came back in, and it's been great. So it's constantly looking at talent identifications, constantly trying to have trials, constantly trying to pick up uh, the phone, the coaches. jared has been brilliant at that. He's uh, one of his great strengths is being able to communicate and find, uh, and to see if there's anybody else out there for us. You know, we're too small not to find the best players, and we should know the best players. So lots of trial games, and then we have one interviews now. We speak to them. We speak to the parents. We give them uh, an opportunity to come down and view it. And then we're pretty ruthless now with it. You know, players who potentially expected to come in he, over the last two years have been disappointed. That's not to say they won't come back, but we've had to be pretty – Pretty ruthless, which is one of the specs from UEFA. You have to deal with what potentially your best players are. And and probably horribly for young players is we have to look at them in two years down the lane, you have to see a player that's going to go across the water. You know, that's what we have to look at. And again, that's very, very difficult. You're just going off experience in your own judgment. And Jimmy, how, how long is that program actually funded for? Four years, Jerry. Uh, so we have a four-year program in place. It'd be interesting to see what happens after that four years. But we, we take them on their GCSE. So they start their GCSEs uh, and, uh, and then they go through that GCSE period at school with us and their preparation then with us leading into potentially leading at 16. Fantastic. And is there, is there many boys that are on it at the minute you think potentially has a chance to go across? Yeah, but again, do you know what? They're highs and lows. There's days you go, oh, Backslapping, high fives, we're the best thing since sliced bread, you know. And then, uh, and then on a fr Friday when we're going through it again, you go, oh, cool, no. What about it's kids, patience. They're going to have many highs and lows throughout, even through our program. It'll be interesting. What we have seen, which has been really good, is that there there are lads who we looked at and we weren't sure who have really taken on board this leadership, you know, this uh, lads who we again, we're quieter, uh, we've really come to the fore, and that's been a real positive for us, taking control of their dorms, you know, uh, taking control of the kitchens, kitchens have to be spotless on a Thursday night prior to leaving, so we've, we've seen emerging talent in terms of leadership, which is exactly what you want. A bit like a, an apprentice program when, when yeah. we first started at Liverpool without having yeah. to do the boots and yeah. all stuff like that. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Brilliant. Jimmy, you may be able to influence it when you get the top job. You can make sure the program still runs and your assistant there, young Jared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's more chance of getting Nelson getting his eye back. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about that, Jimmy. Have you aspirations? I've aspirations to continue in the game, aspirations to manage again, most certainly. I I felt there were unfinished business. Uh when I I, I needed to leave. I needed I needed a break, especially after uh, the Queen, Queen's Park Rangers, uh, Debbie got. So uh, I needed time out, and there were lots of things going on personally, family, parents uh, that needed dealing with. And, and I haven't really had a break since I was 16. And I'm, and again, you, you, we all know you're conscious of the longer you're out of the game, the harder it is to get back in. That's proved to be the case with me in terms of managing in England or Scotland or whatever. But the first opportunity that presented me after not getting the job eight years ago was to go and coach abroad. I went to Melbourne Victory. No hesitation. Absolutely couldn't wait. And I went uh, very open-minded, looking forward to it. Fantastic experience. Didn't win many games, mate, but just had a brilliant, Jim, brilliant tell, opportunity. Jim, tell, tell the guys what, what the, uh, they've renamed that team, haven't they? Yeah, Jimmy Jilton's Melbourne No Victory. <laughs> <laughs> I think if uh, the, the Ipswich fans had their way, they'd have you back at, at Port Melbourne. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm definitely milking it, Jerry, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, obviously I, I, follow, I follow you on Twitter and all the fans come on that they'd have you back in a heartbeat. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, listen, think. Uh, again, 
the way it ended there, I had, I had 10, 11 years there as player and then manager. And it's a fantastic club, steeped in massive tradition in, in the game. You know, Sir Alf Ramsey and, and Bobby Robson, two England managers, you know, won the World Cup, one gets beaten in the semi final. But there's a great tradition around the club uh, with other clubs in, in, in England. So the way it ended, it kind of way, it left a sour taste. But do you know what? The, the owner wanted to make a change. He wanted to put his stamp on the football club. I he inherited me, Jerry. So, and and when you, you select a Roy Keane, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, visual uh, stamp of approval. So yeah. at the time, there wasn't many people commiserating. You know, they just thought this is the next step and Roy's going to take us to the promised land of the Premier League. And I got all that. Listen, he wasn't to know that my mum was ill, seriously ill. You know, at the end of the day, they made a decision to sack me. It was brilliant though. Well, it wasn't brilliant, but it was, uh, it was again, one of those unbelievable experiences you only get in Belfast. Outside intensive care, phone call comes, 10 o'clock, three minutes later, at 10, 11 years of your life, done. That's you finished. So I'm having, I'm having lunch with my dad in, the, in a wee cafe, and, the, and it comes up, uh, Ipswich Town, sack, me children. And there's another boy opposite me, right? My dad's having a fry. I'm, you know, health freak. I think I had a milkshake. <laughs> and he's looked at the TV and he's looking at me and, I, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he went he, put, he went you've had a shit day haven't you <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was brilliant it just, <laughs> just a Belfast banter I loved it absolutely <laughs> and I went yeah but better days <laughs> so, yeah. so the reality hits in but yeah yeah, Look, it was some set up. You, you invited me and Addy Patterson right. over for a week. We done right. a pro license. We spent that's a whole right. day a week with you. Uh, that's uh, right. Some, some, some set up. Um, some set up. Aye, and it was great. Great environment too. But too nice, wasn't it, Jerry? There was a wee niceness about, about it as well. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, my, no. my, youth, my youth in coach at uh, Hull was Dale Roberts, who played. Uh, who died Class. of uh, leukemia. Yeah, 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 yeah. 10, 12 years ago. Smash that's right. Ad, but, yeah. Um, yeah, well, George never recovered, Jerry. Right. His assistant manager, and I, and I'd had a massive effect on George. Mass, it had a massive effect on everybody at the club, and uh, and he was definitely a, a sound bait for for George. He was his right hand man, and it was yeah, it was a sad day for everybody at the club. But some some sad up, as I say, yeah. the whole everything about it. There was um, what did you call the big Scandinavian guy? Uh, he just picked everyone up. If anyone needed their, their groceries or needed a mattress in the house, he went in and... The Raiders and Herman? Yeah. Or uh, Thomas Gardso? Um, he looked after... Big Gareth McCauley was telling me and stuff, you know, if they needed a mattress delivered when they were out training, he would have came to the house. And he oh, Wolf. Big Wolf pal. Big Wolf, yeah. Ah, uh, that's right. He was the liaison guy, yeah. Yeah. I remember, we, we were sitting having lunch one day and you had Campo there. I remember the boy played from Madrid. Yeah. He got yeah. a load of all Armani jeans and all delivered to the training ground. He was just giving them out to the kids. It was all yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, listen, he was a he was an absolute gentleman. I, I flew to Spain, Bilbao actually, and uh done the deal. Uh what a night that was. Uh but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I said I think I said his wife as well that night too. Uh, <laughs> That nah, was great. No, he was a great. He was a great addition. Listen, there, there were, what, there was a lot of what ifs. You know, Ipswich could have went either way. You know, we, we we had this unbelievable home record. I think we won seventeen home games. We went on this crazy and couldn't buy a win away from home. Yeah. Reverse the year after, we we kept winning games away from home and then stumbled at home. So you know, you finish in a point outside playoffs, but expectations just went through the roof. And then, obviously, he wanted to spend a few quid. And Roy had had a fantastic few years at Sunderland with uh, a promotion on a CD. And, you know, they just thought it was left off. But things haven't worked out the way they had all planned. But, uh, no, listen, nothing but good things about the club. And, you know, no, no bitterness now. You know, it was just, it was just, it was a set of circumstances that happened. And you know what football's like. And George Wright's timing. It had to be done. They did it. And that's the rest of the system. However, it's, it's what's his space for the future and your assistant there, young Jared. It's what's his space. Listen, anything can happen. Anything happens in this game. When I was asked about the job, the Northern Ireland job, I said, of course, I'd be interested. Eight years ago, uh, I was interviewed 
and for the last six years, you know, you're going to, you're going to an interview largely based on a CV and bars, largely based on word of mouth. You know, if I'm asked if Jerry played with someone or I wanted to know about a player and Jerry played with him, I'd be ringing the phone, picking up the phone. Jerry, what was he like? What sort of lad is he like? That? Well, that's the game. So yeah. they know exactly. They, they, they know exactly how I work. Six years in a, in a job, coming up six years in a job. So you know, I just thought that uh, I would put it out there and say, of course, I'm interested. Who wouldn't be? Michael has done an absolutely incredible job. You know, the credibility now in terms of where we're now standing. You know, you qualify for major tournament, European championships. You you go to the wire in a World Cup qualifier, and now you have an opportunity to go back to European championships. Players have been tremendous. You know, there's momentum building. It's a great job. It's a great job for someone. And the, the other candidates have all got absolute value and merit. And we'll see what happens. Jim, does it, does it... I'm also good friends with the uh, director at Oxford, so I'll put a word in there for you as well. <laughs> anyway, oh, man, that'll you do, here. Jerry. Let's go. <laughs> uh, Jim, the quick one before we move on. Does it frustrate you when you hear, um, you know, people saying, You've been out of the game too long, or you've been out, out of the yeah. game. Is it? I mean, surely that. I mean, it, it's quite the opposite when you yeah. when you look at it because you haven't. You've been involved heavily around obviously yeah. the Northern Ireland setup. You're in there with Michael O'Neill at Shamrock Rovers. Mm. Um, you know that the programs that you put in place. I've, I spoke about it in Sunday or in Sunday Life Club and I, Natty Academy, and you've been constantly coached. You had an under twenty one campaign with with the under twenty ones. Yeah. Surely, is that frustrating you when you hear that? It frustrates me, but it's like, I mean, Jerry, would you, out of sight, out of mind, and if you're not in that public arena in terms of, like, even your skies and whatever else, you know, people then make judgments, and they actually don't do enough homework. I think it's, I, I, at times it frustrates me because if they did their homework and found out exactly what I was up to, then they'd know that I've had a significant role here. I've coached and managed at every level for Northern Ireland and played at every level for Northern Ireland. But, but beyond that, it's like, all the youth for conferences I've been to, you know, if you stand still, you know, and if you're through learning, you're through. I've constantly tried to update my CV. I've constantly tried to make myself better. I've constantly looked at ways, coaching ways of, uh, you know, developing me as a person, developing me as a coach, looking at all, being around so many unbelievable people in UEFA and, and learning, constantly learning. Like we, we have this conversation on a daily basis. What can we do better? What can we do better? What about this? You know, so, so for me, the last four and a half, five years has just been about me uh, continuing my professional development and yeah. trying to get better and trying to look at ways to get better. And again, you know, the focus is on developing young players. But you never take your, you, you know, I've never missed a senior. I don't think I've missed a senior international game in 15 years, either as working for the BBC or working for the IFA. And constantly watching games, constantly getting England to watch games, Scotland to watch games. You never, you never stop. We never switch off. It's, we're making up we're what, watching football by doing podcasts and, and <laughs> talking about our life. Jerry's revelations have been nothing short of sensational, the stories. And, and that's, that's our lives. Whether we take it or not, but maybe a sad out there, but that's our life. We best <laughs> with our lives. Well, well, that's what makes it a brilliant fraternity. You're you're going to be you're going to be portrayed back into the public spotlight now with being on our podcast. So you know if you get a job, we're going to be something good. Good, good. That's great. Yeah, you were saying there. You're always trying to evolve. We're doing the same. We're trying to up the ante every time. We thought we'd bring on the the future Northern Ireland manager this time. <laughs> you're trying to evolve. You're trying to evolve. You're going from two million to four million in a year. Have <laughs> <laughs> the in fairness to Jimmy, I think you were the favourite the last time round. It was actually quite a shock when Michael O'Neill got the job over, over you, to be honest. Yeah, if, yeah, you're right, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have it over it, Simple. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, skin. Yeah, Michael Rovers. Right. Yeah, Shamma Rovers, he did a terrific job. And I, and, and I played a small part in that uh, with him. And I, I loved it, absolutely loved it. It was terrific and... The whole European campaign was just a fantastic, uh, you know, which we all just embraced it and enjoyed it. And it's another thing, you never realise the size of a club until you're actually part of a club. I didn't realise how big a club Sean McGrew was, was. I became part of it. It's huge, massive, massive history. So to, to be a part of that and to be, you know, to win a league title and then to, to qualify for Europe was great. Loved it. Big, big support down there too. 
Ah, oh, bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. And uh, very passionate about Shamrock Rovers. Very passionate. There's only one club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jimmy, you, look, you, look at the, you look at the platform that uh, Michael O'Neill ended up from Shamrock Rovers, got the Northern Ireland job, and then Stephen yeah. Kenny and I has you know, went on. So, yeah. you know, it actually gives people a, a, a wee bit of, of a boost and confidence mm-hmm. managing within the Irish League. And then, you know, it, where before you'd have said, oh, you have no chance of getting an international job out of it. But no. the last two managers have went on to actually take the two national teams. Yeah, totally. Oren Kearney goes to Samarin and then returns home uh, uh, with lots of plaudits. I think that just on the back of Sean McRover's thing as well, and then, you know, you know Jared, Jared took himself out of a, probably the comfort zone of Clifton, but with, with all due respect, you know, I, I don't know the situation, but certainly when the opportunity to really continue his professional development, he took the plunge. That takes courage. At the end of the day, you're pushing yourself uh, to be better. And again, no disrespect to Clifton Ball at all, but the opportunity came up. He stepped into that em- environment because he, he had the confidence and the ability to take on a big club. Sligo Rovers were a big club. They had, you know, past history, recent history of winning things. So, you know, that's where credit to him comes from. He, uh, you know, he stepped into that and under difficult, difficult circumstances too. But that's constantly looking at you as a manager trying to develop uh, yourself. And, it, and, and as I say, you know, he deserves massive, massive credit for that. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> in, in you're right, Jared, Jimmy. I think you were robbed. You know, the job down there, you've done a, a tremendous job, as Jim said, on a shoestring budget. No, listen, it was an unbelievable experience. Simba, the, the uh, first and foremost, mm-hmm. and one that will never leave me because um, Jim's right, you know, I, it, was a, it was a tough decision. Obviously, Clevenwell was always a club that I sort of supported growing up, uh, played for, uh, coached under Tommy Braslin. Unbelievable four years under him, and then went into what I always wanted to do was manage. Um, but when when Slego came up and and showed an interest, you know it was full time football. And I I always stated that I wanted to be a full time manager. Uh, I always had that mindset of full time being being across the water. So the go to our do what it done um, was was I was very proud, but. It was a difficult job, there's no doubt about it, and I learned so much from it. Um, I, I wanted to be there longer, obviously. I was sold the dream, you know, I was going to be there developing young players, developing the club, um, bringing stability back into the club, and so on and so forth. Kept them up in our first year, last game of the season, which was the, the short term, but then the second, the second bit of that was uh, we were building, and, you know, the, for that to be took away from you, it was, you know, Jim talked about, not bitterness, but, you know, when when you're when you've moved your family, when you devote your time, when you devote everything into it, when you put your heart and soul into something and it's taken away, you know, it's difficult to cope with. And and to be fair, as I said, Jim was brilliant for me when I came away from all that. You know, because he's been there, he's he's, he's done all that himself, and 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 to get involved with Jim so quickly after you know being rejected, basically, you know, was was great for me in terms of my development. So. Unbelievable experience. Um, would it do it again? Absolutely. No hesitation. Um, would it do it differently? I think I've done a good job. I don't, I'm not going to boast about what I've done, but I think I've done a reasonably good job. I, I, you know, there's five or six young players there for the 18 made their debut and are still playing on the team. And, and you know, I think when the new manager came in, you know, again, uh, it was a bigger budget presented to him and, and he ended up finishing in the same position as me and, and, and as I did in the second year. So a young manager went there, done it, uh, experienced the life as a full-time footballer, enjoyed it and, and I would like another opportunity somewhere down the line but at the minute I'm really happy in the job I'm, I'm doing at the minute with, with Jim and the Northern Ireland set up. Well, it feels like an interview, lads. So you're, you're putting yourself in the shop window here. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not with no burdens. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jimmy, you were going to tell us a story about Paul Key. Yeah, oh, there's that many. Keezy's one of them lads. He, he, he doesn't mean to be funny. He's just funny. And anyone who's been around him will tell you that. He had this little thing. We were, we had, it was a boys' Christmas party, and we were going into London. And he was warned, warned about his conduct. On, oh, the whole way up, he was told... No shenanigans, 
right? No messing about. We're going into these bars. Don't just take no messing about. Just be on your best behavior. Then, you know, it kicks in with you. We'll look after you. All right. So Steve Foster, big fuzzy, right? Headband for yeah. Steve, warning him consistently. Not only but he warned him, but he was planning with drink too. <laughs> Dangerous combination for the big fella. So so I'm waking them up the whole way up. So we go into we're in the Covent Garden, and it's the Punch Beauty, very uh, well known bar there, and you have to be on your best. So we're obviously very quiet going in, not. So we're all there. So Keezy has this party trick, and. And you have to watch him, right? And you're constantly on of watching him, corner your eye. Where is he? Where is he? So he disappeared. And we're all going, where is this Egypt? Where is he? And I said, the stairs down to it. Toilet was up up top of the stairs. Big fella comes out with his jeans under his arm, folded, right? With just his Chelsea boots on and his boxer shorts, right? Okay, lads, uh, we'll be moving on to the next bar now, okay? <laughs> Bouncers are running up the stairs. All turf down. Steve Foster wanted to kill him. <laughs> that's that's, that's the, the nicest story I have about him. I can't really go into any of the others. Can't tell any others. <laughs> oh, that's the nicest one. But that was his party trick. He used to disappear, take off his jeans, fold them under his arm, right? Next bar, lads, let's go. <laughs> Not <laughs> brilliant. What about you, Skin? You're going to tell us some of your uh, adventures in New York with Mr. Flynn. Oh, the, the land of promise. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry is 18 years of age, Celtic, loving life. Had a summer break. I think actually, Republic Ireland were playing uh, on a tour the, the, the two weeks that we were there. Um, Pocky Boner was my reserve manager at the time, so um, but. We went over anyway. Jerry says, look, get yourselves over here. You'll make an absolute fortune. You'll clean up, coaching, having a clue. The Yanks having a clue. Just go in, put a session on. You'll get yourself 80 to to $100. No sweat. Happy days. I ain't going to work and counting every day how much I'm making everything going. I'm coming back here with some money. Got there. I think it was about a week in. No sign of work. I went, Jerry, what's happening? Where, where's the work? It'll come. Be patient. I said, I'm only a week left. How are I need to get some work here. Got one day of coaching, eighty dollars. We got, I swear to God, I had to split it between him and him and Tiernan. Um, and that was unbelievable. So they ended up going back to where we were staying. We were staying in a little dungeon. It's just it's place. It's and uh, Jerry, Jerry offered me a, a third egg, a rasa, a rasa match in the wee bedroom. And I was only eighteen. Jerry was a fully grown man at the time. And I absolutely battered him, got him in a head. <laughs> he, he gave up at all. So it's, it's, you know, at WWF, came out, oh, happened, couldn't breathe, battered him. So that was uh, some, one of the stories that some of the stories we had that were unbelievable. Do you remember well, he's he's Pucky, two for zero because I beat yeah. him up in primary school as well. Yeah. <laughs> Pucky Bonner left him four tickets to watch the Ireland game, right? But I'd been in town with a little friend at Matt over there. And, Cork. Uh, I was saying, there's no way you know Pappy Bonner. There's no way he's going to leave tickets. And Pappy Bonner phoned our apartment that day. I was saying, hello, yes, Jared. Yes, yes, this is Jared. No, Jared Little. It was Pappy Bonner, right? So we left him four tickets, but I've been in the city. I goes on out to the game. So it was me, him, Rusty, um, two others. I got to the game first. Your Pappy left the four tickets. I took them, sold two outside. Me and uh, the girl went in. He got the gate. It was done there. He was shooting through the gate. Pocky was about 100 yards away. Pocky, Pocky, it's me and Skin. You had to go and get him an hour for tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Brilliant. Uh, gangster. Absolutely brilliant. So, lads, this is a regular feature uh, on the podcast. I want to know who your, your famous four ball is going to be, Jim. Who did I say? I can't remember who I said. Jack Nicholas was definitely one. Oh, um, I'll, have to look, I'll have to look back now. Yeah. Jack Nicholas. Nelson. Yeah, definitely. Definitely one. He's my all-time hero. Love him. Are we resemblance, are you in check? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you testify when I'm on the golf course, <laughs> I just keep taking the dollars. Up. Good answer. Uh, <laughs> you uh, had Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Was a Nelson self- Mandela. Yeah. Because I wanted, because he say self-isolated for so long, I thought it was a topic of conversation. <laughs> so Ari coped. Uh, who was the other one? George Holy John McBride. Willie John McBride, legend, another one from here. I just absolutely love the stories. 
and he and he I think he played 17 tests for the British lands uh, and Irish lands and I just think what a character what a man all the stories we batter and then the clubhouse would be flying afterwards who was the last one some more one we'd never heard of from a Craigie Estate can't remember his name oh hi George <laughs> and then Bessie we'd all have his nap downs so he'd be getting all the darlings <laughs> and then we just <laughs> <laughs> I'd be going, yeah, I'm a George. I'm a George. <laughs> George, what about you? Um, what was mine? Ah, uh, yeah. So I, I'm thinking more afterwards. Calm in the bar, <laughs> having, a, having a few scoops, having a, a few pints after rattling Jim and golf. Uh, <laughs> Neil, Diamond, Neil Diamond. I, I had it because he'd be unbelievable. Obviously, with a, a few drinks in you and a, and a sing song, guitar out. Um, sing along with Neil. Um, the second one was Paulo De Canio. Uh, I remember back in, in the Celtic days, you know, training alongside him, and it's unbelievable footballer and an absolute lunatic. <laughs> I can testify that too. Yeah, I was with him at Sheffield Wednesday. Lunatic. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you a story afterwards. I think a good story about Paulo. But um, but yeah, so Paulo De Canio, unbelievable player, lunatic. Would say you'd be on a edge around him, you know, if you're sitting on the drink box, <laughs> wouldn't know what to be up to. Um, the the third one was actually Jim Magelton because <laughs> after after right. playing, after playing a four ball and coming in, I would be racing in to tell everybody that I absolutely rattled him a golf, just close <laughs> and let everybody know that I was battering him. And the third, the fourth one would be Mike Tyson. Just in case, I would say it would be difficult. Um, Paulo De Cano, I would imagine, would talk about himself more than Jim. <laughs> Not sure. No. There'll be a wee fight there somewhere, you know what I mean? About it's not the Jim show, it'll be the Paulo show. So, <laughs> big Mike, big Mike will sort the fight out, he'll sort out any, any uh, messing about. So, that would be my four, but absolutely brilliant, lads. So, I know you're both on Twitter working. If anybody wants to contact you, how do we do it? They'll be contacting me. No. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you Jared owes your money, Liam Neeson wouldn't find them. No, I have to block. If I owe your money, you're blocked on Twitter. <laughs> Jared, yeah, I'm thinking like of some some manager here in England. You you may get yourself out there now. Okay, oh, little, okay. Belfast, little Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, what about you? What's your handle on Twitter? I I'm on Twitter. I forget what my thing is. Is it Matilda Seven or something like that? Hold on, I just check here, Jim. Yes, J. Magilton. That's it. I have my Jilton Seven, sorry, that was your That's it. Insta you're doing with the kids, I like it. Well, I'm seeing just <laughs> right on golf. Yes, sure. I need to tell you a story about the first time Jared ever played golf. <laughs> me, me, him and Tierna Lynch. I knew this story. Me, him and Tierna Lynch are on a part oh, in New York, right? So, True. I tease off, bump, hit the green, Tierna and tease off. He was out of bounds. <laughs> Again, was just we, I knew there was something up. He was looking at this sign, looking at this sign, and I went, or he's about to say something. And he says, What's divoids? <laughs> Please replace the divots. What's divoids? Oh, <laughs> for about 20 minutes, couldn't move a laugh. Uh, uh, <laughs> he didn't replace him anyway. Absolutely brilliant. Well, lads, that, that has been absolutely fantastic. I'm sure the viewers will love every minute of that. Thanks very much for coming on. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jared. Pleasure. I think, I think you boys will be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> Hope not. <laughs> Thanks very much, lads. <laughs> See you, lads. Today we're joined by a legend of Irish football, the one and only Mr. Paul Byrne. How are you doing, Paul? How are you, lads? Okay. Good to have you on the Paul. show. And we're also joined by John Quinzer Quinn, who is a Celtic super fan. How are you doing, Johnny? All good, Collie. All good. Good to see you. And obviously I've got my great friend there, Jerry Flynn. I always forget about Jerry. He's the main man. One of the One of the Colin. One of the yeah, okay, well, now, he's, he's he's you too. <laughs> Paul, just tell us a wee bit about yourself and your background. Well, basically, lads, what, I, what it all started for me was back in Dublin, uh, you know, playing football in the streets. It's, it's, all we, it's all we knew. It's all we had, basically, you know. 
uh, in the times that we grew up in, you know, the, the early 80s and stuff like that. Well, early, late 70s, early 80s. And I always knew I wanted to be a footballer. School went out the window, you know yourself. But we started on a local field just across the road. And there's quite a few players from that area. The likes of, you know, Melchie Reid, Alan McCann, Mark O'Neill. Oh, we're going away to, to English clubs as well. We're good enough to go away to English clubs. We all learned their trade playing against each other. So you'd have sort of like the avenue, you'd have the, the park, you'd have the gardens, and the gardens would play against the avenue, and the avenue would play against the park. And we'd some great footballers in good times. And we were only kids, running about like, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years of age. And we'd make our own goals on the field. And the mothers would, you know, I don't know, remember the old onion sacks years ago. Uh, the orange ones, we used to stitch all them together and make the nets and yeah. all, the, all the drunken outlets to come up the road to have a game of ball with their cobnail boots and they'd be kicking the ball around. There'd be some great memories and great times, you know. And uh, that's where it all started for me on the streets, you know. Brilliant. And who, who did you join first? Who was your first club? My first club was Blue Bell. Uh, Blue Bell United there on the, on the nice road. And well, a couple of small clubs before that, like the looks of Vinci Corp. Uh, I met the looks of Harry Fox, wanted me to go to Stella Maris, but we, we couldn't really travel and just play for the team that was the local, you know, and it was, it started off at Belgrave at a very, very young age, uh, under seven was or eights, and then I went to Bluebell under tens, and I stayed there till I left to go to Oxford uh, when I was 13 years of age. Well, what year were you at Oxford? Because we guy from Belfast, Frankie Donnelly was over at the time, and Jim McFadden, who played in the Irish League with Clivemore, they were both over. Well, I would have I would have went there when Oxford won the Milk Cup. You know, you had Jeremy Charles, uh, Davy Lang and Billy Hamilton, Ray Helton, John Aldridge. I used to clean the boots when I first went to 13. You won the Mill Cup. Uh, and then later on, Jim McJilton came in and Paul Key came in and that's where my career went downhill. <laughs> 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 they, they might blame me, but no, I'm not having it. <laughs> yeah, right Jim McFadden tells us a story about borrowing John Aldridge's boots, but he never gave them back. No, yeah. that's I, I was going to say I didn't borrow them, I robbed them. <laughs> <So did he. laughs> yeah, but well, see, if I had a said I'd borrowed them, you would have known that I borrowed them or robbed them through Jim <laughs> <laughs> And I robbed them and you thought I borrowed them. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, how did you end up coming back uh, home to, to Bangor? I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to give you a story before that. Uh, mm. I was, after breaking into the first team, I was 16 at the time and I was flying. Made me debut against Middlesbrough and then I played against Spurs and I played a couple of other games, won a couple of man of the matches. Jim O'Jill, I think, played in one of the games. Uh, Paul Key definitely did when I was there. But what happened was, this fella Brian Orton took over, you know, Nobby Orton from the yeah. Man City Hall. And, and basically, we just clashed. I was a copley Irish lad that felt that he should be in the first team and not the usual. And basically, I was after playing about four or five games on the bounce. And he brought me to, uh, he brought me to Sheffield I think he united our Sheffield Wednesday in the FA Cup and he says, look, I'm going to I'm gonna leave you out. Uh, I'm going to go with experience today. And my words to him was, how the fuck do you get experience? You know, obviously you get experience by playing in, in my eyes, you know. But uh, anyway, and <laughs> what happened was, <laughs> he left me out of the game anyway and they all went out onto the pitch and them days, they used to bring extra boots and extra track suits and stuff, you know. So basically, because he didn't pick me, I just put them all into one skip and went to the airport and brought them all home. <laughs> <laughs> and every, 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 little fucker was, every little fucker in Dublin was going around with one computer jerseys and one computer tracks. <laughs> so they nicknamed, me, they, nicknamed me, they nicknamed me the robber. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. And did you never go back? Did you just leave and that was you done? No, what happened was, I ended up staying there until I was 19. I, you know, the thing was, I had to, obviously, like everything else, I had to pay for all my phone bills when I ran them up the wall because I missed home. Um, it was a good job I actually broke into the first team because when I first went there, I was on sort of £13.50 a week, but they give you digs. Mm. But, and then they give you, the second year it was 17 25 and the first year pro was 125 but because I was playing in the first team and, you know, you wanted to sub, you get an extra 200 quid. It was, it was great. But too much money too too quickly. You know, the bookies came along. Steve Foster showed me how to put a bet on. But I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forgive him. <laughs> bollocks after that. But, no, I mean, these are all learning experiences, things that you have to do in life and experience in life. And for the great time at Oxford, met some great people, played some wonderful footballers. Um. But then I came home, actually, I went to Arsenal after that with George Graham. 
a fella called Theo Foley and George Graham. And I played about six months in the resis there and played with some great footballers, you know, like Paul Merson was there at the time and uh, David Hilliard, Ray Parler, that was their centre midfield. You Rocky, Rocky on the on the right, Davis sometimes played, you know, Tony Adams. We did we had a great squad and a great team, but eventually he bought a fella called Jimmy Carter, believe it or not. Uh, I think Jimmy went from Millwall to Liverpool and he brought him from Liverpool That's to right. Arsenal. Yeah. Useless fucker, but I ever met one and I was disappointed. <laughs> I said to George Graham, look, if you're going to sign him, I said, I'm, I'm off. I said, I'm just, I've, I've got to offer some back home and uh, I'm off. And uh, if you funny enough, a few years later, I met George Graham. He said, you're fucking right. <laughs> <laughs> but look, you don't like to tell people I told you so. But the moral of the story is I came back to Bangor and I met all you guys then. And, you know, we, you know, I was probably one of the first ones traveling up on the train on my own. 20 years of age, traveling up and down to the north. At the time, it was a bit trouble up that way, and I was shit myself. Couldn't wait to get fucking. Once I got past Rotter, I could relax. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was then, you know, I, I just traveled back and forth, and I really enjoyed the club. It was a small club, no, no pressure. You know, you weren't expected to win trophies like Glen Thorne and Linfield and people like that. And we had Rainy, Rainy Hill and, and Jock O'Connor and Browner, and, we, you know, we had a great squad. You know, Mark Glenn Denon. You know, we had some good, then Ferguson come in as well, he was scoring goals. And we had a great little balance uh, at Bangor, Barry McCready. And, uh, you know, you had hard fuckers, you had tacklers, you had runners, you had lazy fuckers, me and Ricky McAvoy included in that bracket. <laughs> so, you know, met some great people, some great times. And, you know, you know the rest is history, but I happened up there with myself and I never really expected it. But I think where, where it really helped me was going away such an early age to be playing at a certain level, training with senior lads at such a young age and playing in, like, it would be the old, it'd be the new Premier Division now, like, you know, but it was the old fourth division then. And it stood me in good stead in a lot of ways. I had to grow up quickly and stuff like that. And it was, it was great days, but banger. You know, the way, the way, the way that year ended, you know, winning the Bastards Cup, scoring the goal in the, in, in the Cup final, winning the young player, the player's young player and senior player and the writer's junior and senior player. And Georgie, best to give you your trophies and sign a three-year contract for Celtics. So what more do you want the boy from Dublin? Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Jerry, were you Banger at the time? I had, just le I had just left Banger and went to Hull because um, Sass and all the players that you just mentioned were there. But um, I remember I came back about two years later and you were at Banger and I remember playing for Ballyclare against you. So you had to be playing, I think, wide right. I was... Um, left side of midfield and I've only told this story today for the first time but I rem I'm actually embarrassed to say it but I remember you said to me you were running me with a ball you sort of stopped and put your foot on you said here kid watch your lace and I looked down you just on a step over and went you know, <laughs> 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 uh, that, that was probably the only way I was going to get fucking past you <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was, I've never told anybody that until today. <laughs> but you know what? I wouldn't have fucking told anybody either. <laughs> so Johnny, oh, have you a question there for Paul? Yes, so Paul, you, you went from Bangor to, to Celtic. Yeah. Um, and Liam Brady signed you. But you, you played for quite a few managers in a short time in, in Celtic, didn't you? It was a bit of a, bit of a tumultuous time. Yeah. So, uh, do you know what? Back on the circuit now with the lads and stuff like that, we do have a laugh, you know, about this. Uh, you know, people say to me, oh, you scored those two goals against Rangers and I'll be sitting beside John Hartson or Alan Thompson and he'd go to me, oh yeah, but you're only 11 behind me. You know, because <laughs> he got 13 goals or something against Rangers. But it's a great bit of banter. But the time that I went, it was very, very, you know, I actually thought I was going to Celtic. I was going to get a few quid, play for two years and I'll be back. That's what I honestly thought. Yeah. I never thought, with the, looking at the players that was there, Charlie Nicholas, Frank McIverney, Paul McStay, Packy, John you know, Collins. You know, players like that. And, you know, and I was just thinking to myself, look, I'm feeling myself here. But look, I've earned the contract. I've done well in the Irish League. I've played a few years. See how I got on. I might get a little move to a lot of club in England and we kind of take it from there. It didn't work out that way either. The club was in dire straits. But the pressure just to play for Celtic Football Club yeah. is immense. It's, everybody would know that, right? But to stop Rangers doing nine in a row... And for the club, and for the club nearly going under, that was a very, very difficult time for me and, and for a lot of other players. For me personally, I was on a high. I was playing with the best, one of the best clubs in, in the world, 
Israel. Really- um, you know, and it was very difficult, even though, look, we were playing against players, Brian Laudrup, Basil Bowley, uh, Ian Durant, Ali McCoist, Ferguson, Gary Stevens, Trevor Gordon Stevens. Gordon Jury. Did a, did a quality side, like, you know. And I'm looking around the change room, we've got Willie Faulkner, Wayne Biggins, Andy Payton, and I'm thinking, <laughs> fuck, fuck, when an Ibrox here, we're not going to get her. You know what I mean? Paul, Paul there, there was the match, Paul, if you, I don't know if you remember, uh, New Year's Day at Parkhead, 94? Yeah. yeah. Colin, Colin was there. There was a whole crowd of us went in the boat, had a ball, went to the ground, and we were there about a half hour before the game, and they were doing the warm-up. And yeah. Celtic were running. You know, Rangers, as you say, had Hitley, and they had Mikhailachenko, and all sorts of superstars. Yeah. And we were watching Celtic doing the warm-up, and I'm not kidding you. We, like, we had a few pints, and we looked at each other and said, oh, my God. I think, I think, I think we were three or four, one down after fucking 25 minutes or something. Yeah. Like, it two nil in three minutes. Two, yeah, yeah. Two, go, two goals in the first two or three minutes. Yeah, and Hitley answer. scored. I remember that. I remember that. Look, I played eight times against Rangers, and I scored twice against them. But I think I only lost twice uh, in, in the eight games. One was at uh, Hamden, they beat us 3 1, and the other was at Parkhead. But you see, to be honest with you, from a selfish point of view, I was playing for Glasgow Celtic Football Club. I was playing with the players that I used to watch on the telly. Um, you know, the money was great, the fans were brilliant. But if, I had, if Celtic had been winning leagues at that time and winning, you know, cups and, and, and playing well, the mistakes, we wouldn't have been scrutinised as much and the mistakes that we would have made would have just went blown under the carpet. But because yeah. you're in dire straits and you have a bit of a bad game, you're picked out and you're scrutinised yeah. for all the mistakes that you make, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. There, was a lot, there was a lot of pressure on the serious side of, of, of what I've done in my career. That was one of the po- most probably stressful. You know, you're, you're going to training every day and you're thinking, you know... Lou McCary, you, you, you probably want to go into the stories about the different managers and stuff like that. As when I always do podcasts, people always say, who's the best manager, who's the worst manager? But um, I think I owe, I think I owe them all sort of like an equal little bit of praise, if you know what I mean? Because Liam Brady bought me. He, he, he let me live for him. He got me fit. He gave me the chance. Um, and then obviously, like Frank Connor, who yeah. people used to probably know yeah. because he's yeah. self Frank gave me me chance in the first team because he had me for six months in the reserves. He seen what I could do and he got me fit. And, and then Lou McCarty came in and he he, gave, he doubled me, me me contract because I was in the Ireland squad in '94, the World Cup squad with Jack Charlton, and he he doubled me contract, he doubled me wages. Um, so I was quite happy with that, obviously. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, but it was only on fucking two hundred quid a week. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a lie. It was, on, it was on a bit more than that. It was on two fifty. But <laughs> the thing was, and then like God came in Himself, which is Tommy Burns, and He played me in all the high-profile games, and and uh, as I said, I owe them all that little bit of gratitude, and, and you know, but yeah. it was it was it was terrible times, you know. I'm sure for the fan, it was it was awful, but for the player to be involved in what was going on behind the scenes and stuff was yeah. even equally as equally as awful. Yeah. Did Did you ever meet Fergus Mc, Fergus McCann? Yeah, I met Fergus McCann, but he was the so he was the one that came in and obviously, you know, the promises yeah. that he made, he fulfilled. You know, we, 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 were, playing, we were playing at Hamden for the year when, when Parkhead was getting done and we were getting beaten by Park Tissel 3 and 4 1 and the Pistons are around on a Wednesday night. And you're looking around, and as I said, your players like Wayne Biggins and fucking Andy mm-hmm. Payton. And it was like, you know, come here. I never felt world class when I first went to Parkhead playing with the looks of Comics Day and Frank McGovern. You know, I felt fucking world class when I went. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, Paul, I, I I played with Andy Payton at Holy Left all and went there. God love you. <laughs> yeah. He actually scored a few goals, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here, he didn't fucking score any Jared Little was on the podcast today, and he was saying he was, he cleaned your boots at Celtic Park, but you never tipped him a Christmas. He's gonna send him that now. <laughs> I, was, I was going to add in my son signing on fee. Yeah. <laughs> I would have done the deal. On that, is your son at Linfield did I read? No, he's he's gone out of Linfield nearly two years now. He's over at he's the captain of TNS in Wales. Well, very good. Very yeah, good. the new the new Saints. He's actually coming home now. I think he's going to go to Cork or Water, but I'm not too sure. But he'll be going he'll be going to one of them when he comes back. I think he's back on the 18th of April. I think. Oh, 18th yeah. of May. Is he a chip off the old block? Is he a tricky winger? 
he's, do you know what he is? He, he's one of these, he's a lazy bastard like me anyway. Put that <laughs> and uh, all he wants to do is play in the hole in behind the front two. To me, that's a lazy bastard. But, uh, we lads exact same. <laughs> yeah. No, he, has, no, he, has a bit, he has a bit about him. If you, if you go onto YouTube and Google Curtis Bourne's goals, he, he scores some fantastic goals and he, he picks up great little positions. He's both footed and he, you know, he, 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 can, he can read and see the game and he's not afraid of doing things outside of the boot and little things like that, which I like to see yeah. in players anyway. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's coached enough nowadays in, in kids. I think more so of anything, the, the, the street football is being coached back out of the kids. Um, I think they should be free spirits to, to a certain age. And then, because at the end of the day, you've got the school teacher telling them how to play the game. You've got his father telling them how to play the game. And then you've got his, his coach and, uh, uh, you know, his local football team telling them how to play the game. And they're telling them three different things. Um, yeah. I just think that, you know, you should be able to be free spirits to a certain age. And then when you get to a certain age, you're not a free spirit anymore. You're told how to play the game. And if you don't listen to the coach, you're taken off, which I think is very unfair, but that's, that's another day. Yeah. yeah. We had Lee Finney on uh, last week, and he was saying when he went from Linfield, he was one of those free spirits, great at running the people, taking men on, and Dick Advocat basically coached it out of him. You know, pass, yeah. pass, go. Yeah, that's exactly. And it's, you know what, lads? It's happening, it's happening, it's still happening. You know, the kids are terrified because the parents are watching, you know, Messi in the Champions League and they're watching the, you know, the football on Sky every, every week and stuff like that. And you expect that kids to be able to do the same. Yeah. And it doesn't work like that, you know, it just doesn't. And then the kid get, comes a little bit threatened and he's frightened and he doesn't want the ball and he comes a little bit scared to play the game that he, that he should be allowed, to be, as we say, a free spirit. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think, going back, lads, thinking about it, I think that's where I get into so much trouble. I used to tell all my coaches to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> You're very shy. I, I, I always was. Yeah, Paul, Paul, I had, um, and the stories that I've done for, uh, on my YouTube channel and stuff, just on the, the day of the coronavirus and stuff, keeping everybody entertained, I told one about Roddy when he went to Carlisle. Um, I've no doubt you have a couple of stories about Roddy you can share with us today. I was in Carlisle with Roddy. <laughs> you and, were? Uh, well, I told him the one where yeah. he put the two. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you one minute. I was actually, you know, as everybody knows, I always prone to putting on that little bit of weight. And I was out with the game for about three or four months. And Roddy says to me, come over to Carlisle and you get yourself fit. I'll give you a contract. Went over there, won't be bollocks off. Trained us, you know, twice. A day. I think we're in the middle of pre-season. You're doing two sessions a day playing a couple of games, you know, practice matches and stuff like that, got myself down to the weight. And what he says to me, I'm starting in the centre forward, sorry. And I was like, starting in the centre forward, sorry. I said, I'm not giving you fucking six months of my life, training me bollocks off, and you turn around and tell me you're starting in the centre forward. That's Roddy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Roddy. That's Roddy, right? Well, I'll give you another one about Roddy. It's fucking gas. I'll give you two, two or three, actually. And uh, <laughs> when I first signed for Roddy, right, Roddy was out, I think I played one game for Shells, right? And Roddy came down, we were playing, I was playing in a, a first team game for Shells. It was a, a friendly down in Adams Cross, I think, and Roddy was watching. And he, I was getting on the ball and I was doing certain things. And Roddy says, of all the times I met Roddy in the north and stuff, Roddy goes, who's that number 10 in the middle of the park? And someone said, that Roddy, Roddy that's Paul Bourne. He said, no way. But I must have been about late in 20s down or something like that. The shorts were bet on me. Couldn't get the socks up off my calves. And uh, Roddy goes... <laughs> Roddy goes, nah, that's not him. So he come off the pitch and Roddy, Roddy was the manager of Bowles. And he goes, this is Bungie. He says, eh, I'd like to sign you. He said, but well, you're going to have to get yourself fit. So he said, give me a couple of days. I says, right. So he goes back to the board and the board says to him, nah, Roddy, you can't sign him. He's fucking mad. And he's overweight and this, that, and the other. But he says, no, listen, I'll get him fit. He'll win us the league. So anyway, long story short, goes in with Roddy and get myself fit and stuff like that. And, the first game comes at the start of the season. Roddy hands me these pair of shorts. It like, was like a marquee that you'd have a few drinks in, right? And I put them on me. He says, Bones, you put them on you. He says, I'll make you look slimmer. And they must have been, they must have, they must have been wearing Taiwan. They were fucking XXXXXL, right? So at the end of the game, I, was, I think we won 2 1 or scored one and made one. And the board says, right, we're going to give the contract. So he gave me the contract. But Roddy told me after the game, he was after stitching two pairs, not Carlo and his wife, to stitch two pairs of shorts together. <laughs> <laughs> it made me look slim. <laughs> and it worked. It, it worked and I got a two-year contract. But another time, <laughs> another time, Roddy's family are all boxers, you know. And Stephen used to have a gym in, 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 in Dublin. 
And he used to take us there on a Wednesday. And Roddy used to always love to get you on the bags and the ropes and that sort of stuff, hook you up, put you in the ring and bat you if you annoyed him and all that sort of stuff. But that's the way he was. Mm. I used to take the Roddy, oh, I'm a lover and a fighter, you know? So I had about 14 grannies and 15 granddads and they all died on the Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, ne I, ne I never went to the gym, right? So one night, the, the, the full time was just to train every morning, but the part time was Tucky O'Connor, Blocker, and people like that used to come in and just sort of every second evening. So we'd do a double session. So all of a sudden, he, I, I comes in second last, and all the lads are standing up around with the chairs. He's at the move and the treatment table and across. He's seen this black bag in the corner. And I goes, what the fuck's that? He says, everybody stand, everybody stand up. He says, right, Bonesy, over here. So he goes over to him, he opens up the bag, throws out two big spare, uh, sparring gloves that he brought from the gym. He says, if you can't come to the gym, the gym is coming to you. And I put them on. And he fucking battered me. <laughs> he absolutely murdered me in that change room, right? <laughs> that was another story with Roddy. But the best one was, right? This is the best one. We're halfway through the season. And... Uh, he was going to get sacked. We're playing out in Morton Stadium and Rovers is beating the feet was 4-0 at half-time, right? And he comes in at half-time and it's pissing out of heavens. Opened up just before half-time. Flair's slipping all over the place. And Roddy goes in, he's going around, he's going, and you, and this, that, and the other. And he comes to A.B. John, a black lad. He says, and you, we start gaffer, he says. He says, you're like fucking Bambi. And he start gaffer, I'm going to change my studs. I'm going to change my studs. Change them into your shoes and fuck off, he says. <laughs> <laughs> so... So he's going, he's going around, right? And he comes around to me and he goes, I'm fucking you. What have you got to say? And I said, buddy, listen to me. Listen very, he said, no, I'm not fucking listening. I said, well, go on then. He said, tell me, what do you got to say? I said, buddy, them fans are shouting, Polly Bourne's wife takes it up there. And he goes, he pauses for about, he pauses for about two minutes and goes, do you know what you do? Close your fucking curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and, we went, and we went down one six four, and he stayed. We saved his job. His job, oh, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> you must have backed yourselves that day, didn't you? Oh, uh, stop! Well, come here. There was, a, there, was a, there was so many with Roddy. It was just unbelievable. There was a couple. There was a couple. Another. There was another time we were fucking going out to play in the playoffs. We we're leaving at eight o'clock to play against Hull. We stopped off on the way down. I've ordered a big fucking breakfast roll. You know me too. Right? I'm in. The, I'm in. The, I'm in the garage, and I've ordered. Yeah, it says, mate, give us two rashes, two sausages, two eggs, a bit of red sauce there. <laughs> Roddy's head comes over the shoulder and goes, who's that for? He says, yeah, man. He said, it's for him. He says, it isn't, it's bollocks. He says, give me that. He says, he's not fucking eating that. He has a match tonight at 8 o'clock. So anyway, right? So, so I said to Roddy, well, fuck you. You can pay for it and leave me alone, you bastard. So anyway, gets back onto the bus. He hands the bus. He hands the, the bus driver the fucking roll, right? And uh, he was still eating when we got the car. Was that... <laughs> 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 they're little teams, you know, that, you, that you'll always remember. It was like a French stick by the time we fucking... <laughs> oh, stop. So, Johnny, have you an old question over Paul? Paul, do you regret not playing in a more successful Celtic team, like in the stadium at the minute? You know, at yeah, the rest of the 16th... I think, I, I, I've always said this to Simon Donnelly, and I always say it on the, on the, on the thing with the Q&As and stuff, and he doesn't mind me saying it. Like, Simon Donnelly was no better player than I was. Mm. Yep. And Simon Donnelly went on to play with Larson and John Hartson and Alan Thompson and all those team players and won three league titles and three Scottish Cups and league Cups and stuff like that. So I think if I had got the chance with the ability that I had and how fit I was at the time, uh, I think I wouldn't have looked at our place and certainly wouldn't have been scrutinised as much because we would have been winning trophies and, Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's just, it was just unfortunate really. It was really, really unfortunate at the time that I was there. But come here, yeah. I loved every minute of it. People <clears> never <throat> let you forget it. You score two against Rangers, you travel anywhere in the world, you know, you're still signing teams, you're still in photographs, you're still, and that's, that's good enough for me. We, we have a friend, Jerry and, Jerry and Simba and ourselves, a guy called Kevin McGreevy, who's now living in Australia. He's Celtic fanatic, and he said when he goes and he buys the, you know, the, the draw before the game, he said if he ever wins it, he's going to run naked across to lift the check. But I'm just thinking... he doesn't when, fucking win it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just thinking when you scored that wonder goal at Ibrox, and then you ran towards your own supporters, like, what, what, what must you have felt that night? I mean, that was yeah. such a goal. 
Yeah, it's like, do you know what? The, uh, I played in a few games before that. My very first game against Rangers, we were 1-0 down. And uh, I think I made the equaliser. And then in the 89th minute, Brian O'Neill came on and we got a corner kick and Brian O'Neill scored at, at, at Ibrox. And we won 2-1. And the crowd just went absolutely ballistic. And I thought to myself, my God, what an atmosphere. Brilliant. Never felt that like it. Never seen that like yeah. it. And then I said to myself, imagine if I had a scored. And yeah. A few, a few weeks later, I did. I scored at Ibrox, made it 1-1, and it was the best feeling ever. And uh, as I said, you would sell the supporters. We call it the Celtic family, and you just never... I think I'm only getting... It's probably... I felt like I've done a, a report for the Herald in, in Scotland there last week, and he says to me, I think it's only now that you're getting the recognition that you mm-hmm. should have got when you're playing, because people didn't realise that, you know, how really, how bad the team had gone, and, and the chances yeah. behind everything, like, you know? And for people to hear your side of the story when things are really bad, like we've all heard about the, the you know, the, the last years and stuff like that. But I always say to John, John Collins and the boys, I'm having a bit of laughs, Simon Donnelly, well, when we meet up, there's one thing they can never take away from me. The certain players might have more goals to me against Rangers, but it doesn't have a ring to it. Now, you're going to laugh at this, right? It doesn't have a, it's quite a ring to it, but it, this is how it goes, right? Jimmy Johnston. Number seven, Bagley's number seven, Larson number seven, and Bonesy number seven. Not bad, <laughs> not bad. I, I got to wear the number seven jersey, but it doesn't have that same ring to it than the other quality uh, players. Uh, oh, uh, where that, were they? That is living, living the dream. Massive, yeah. Massive. Oh, you're a wee bit like myself. You've got that, I call it an engine room. And when you were brilliant, nobody ever mentioned your weight. The first thing you had a bad game or saying that big fat shit can't play. He's rough. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's just the way it's always been. But do you know what? The, the, the way I've always... I've always suffered with, with my wife, but if I put my mind to something, I can, I can drop it fairly quickly. Um, but look, listen. Uh, when you're playing football, people have opinions. Opinions are like arseholes. And you have to listen to that many arseholes slagging off over your weight. That can't even get off the couch to go to work. Never mind the team, but I achieved in my career. So be it. Let them at it. Let them at it. I mightn't have all, I mightn't have the medals, I mightn't have the money, but I've got the memories. Yeah. Brilliant memories, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Paul, you were you were saying just before we we came on earlier that you're you're doing a uh, thing for the homeless in Dublin. Can you just yeah. uh, talk a little bit about that? Because it, it's something that we're through our through my website, we're we're gonna be giving something back also. So I wanna team up with you on that. Yeah, it's 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 just something that's badly needed, Jerry. You know, it's I'll go I'll go to work every morning and I'm looking at these people sleeping in doorways and you know all right, they might have uh, you know, alcohol problems or they might have drug problems or whatever, but they're, in this day and age, in, in, our, in our country, we shouldn't have people sleeping on the streets, but unfortunately we do. And there's two different types. Obviously, there's ones who are looking for housing and there's ones that we're just happy with a hostel. And the, the crowd that we're dealing with is that they go around and give their free time to give these people cups of soup, cups of tea, sandwiches, stuff like that that they badly need in, in, in the cold days and the cold nights that they're on the streets. And, I just felt, you know, I've got a lot of celebrity friends here in Dublin, you know, different bands, different comedians. I'm, I'm part of the Celtic uh, Ex-Players Association. Um, you know, the likes of Petrov and all these lads. And it's something that I've got access to. And I felt, OK, what can I do here to, 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 to raise a few pounds? And basically what I did, I went on, you know, obviously Facebook, the power of Facebook and stuff like that. And I got good feedback. And, a lot of people start to back me, Conor McGregor and people like that are saying fair play. And uh, a multi multi millionaire in Glasgow that I met in Philadelphia uh, just sold his business for 53 million. And, um, you know, he's buying tables for, on, on the night and stuff like that. You're going to make donations. And I just think that if we all just give a little bit back. I've got that in my locker to help with the, the most unfortunate than, than we are. And uh, I'm only happy to do so. I'm going to put it to the lads. There was no questions asked yet. They're in. And, uh, we organised it for the 19th of April, which was cancelled because of pandemic that's going on at the moment. And we're we'll looking at the way the things slow up a little bit and then maybe come up with a different date. But now other people and ex-players in Cork have asked me what to bring them there. Ex-players in, in Galway have asked me. Uh, people in Cliftonville are looking to have a game up in Cliftonville as well. And it's just great, you know. Um, it's great that they, we can we can all get together as friends and meet up again and have a game of ball. And, and by doing that, raise a few quid for the most unfortunate. Fantastic. Well, well, as I say, keep keep me updated, and we'll, we'll chat offline, and uh, we, yeah. we'll take a table and stuff like that. We'll do some other stuff as well. So yeah, yeah we'd be delighted no, to help. There's no problem, Jerry, and there's no there's no pressure on anybody, um, to do so. Uh, 
But look, every, every, every little bit helps. You know, people from the established sports clubs are donating, you know, 50 in Philadelphia, $50, $100. So that all, all adds up. And we're just happy to, you know, put a game on and us, us to get out and have a few points and have a chat. Magic. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Paul, tell us what you're doing now. Well, basically, I'm in the, I work for a company called CISC, right? Which uh, I do all the logistics for CISC for, 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 for the main jobs. Um, but I'm in the middle of talking to the likes of Tony Adams, Paul Mason. And we all had problems with sort of alcohol along the way, somewhere along the way. And uh, I'm involved with now the PFAI down here. In, I don't know if you know Stephen Han Stephen O'Hanlon down here yeah, in Dublin. Heard of him? Heard of him? Jerry, yeah. Jerry might know. Him. And basically, I just felt that there was nothing for me to guide me as a young lad and prepare me for going away to England uh, at the time that I went. And maybe if there was, I wouldn't have fell, in, fell into the bracket of the difficulties that I fell into as a teenager and, you know, in my in late teens with drink and other, other things going on in my lunch. Um, but through the, you know, if you've got a problem in your marriage, you go to a marriage counsellor. If you've got a problem about drugs or alcohol, you go, you go and, you know, speak to someone. So what I'm, looking to, what I'm basically looking to do is set up that. But through the guide them before they go away, but it's not the end of the world when they come back, but some kids think they do. You fall into alcohol, you fall into drugs, and um, you go back and live in the family homes, they cause trouble for the mother and father, and things go a little bit pear shaped in, in their lives, and they feel their own worth and stuff like that because they fail as a footballer. And I'm looking to set something up when I'm speaking to the right people at the moment uh, to get something set up before they go away to guide them and for when they come back. So yeah, I'm, I'm, looking to, I'm looking to do it. And if anyone knows, boys, drink, failed marriages. Uh, having plenty of money, having nothing, having money again, it's, it's, it's me. And if I can guide them in the way that don't do what I did when I went away, do this, and don't do this when you come back because you'll end up in what happened to me. And sure. if, if, if that yeah. helps one or two people, well, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Are you doing any coaching at the minute? Yeah, I do a lot of, it's a lot of local clubs that would ask me, you know, but it's just getting the time now, you know, between... Yeah. Look, I probably, when, when the circus sets back up again, we're going to have so many trips now. It's going to be, as I said to you, Dublin, Galway, Cork, Belfast, New York, South Africa, Australia. Yeah. All these times, and then in around my job, and I have a 10 year old daughter as well that, that I see when I can. You know, I see her every week, but I just want to see her as much as I can. And a girlfriend, you know, it's just a lot of stuff that just goes yeah. on. I'm, I'm on. I work for Radio Sunshine with Ken Doherty and Reggie Corrigan. We have our own show on a Saturday morning uh, that goes 9 till 11 live in Dublin. Um, we cover horse racing, golf, cricket, snooker, football, and we have a bit of crack at that as well. So, yeah, there's a lot going on at the minute. And, um, if I can get out and do a, a couple of sessions for a few people, I'm, I'm more than happy to do so. Brilliant. The radio shows that it sounds like something we should be on. Absolutely brilliant. I was thinking the same thing. Do you know what? Do you know what? We, we, it's, it's like, do you know, it's like us sitting here now having a chat, lads, and we just the is we're live and we're live on air. And, Obviously, you can't do a little bit of swearing and, and tell the sort of stories yeah. that I've just told you, but we have our own little way of, you know, we, we speak to Park Harton, we do have Dunphy on the show, we do have, you know, all the lads. I, I bring a few of the lads in, get a few Liverpool lads, like United, ex Celtic. Then we have Reggie with the rugby, and we have a good little show and a bit of crack on the, on the morning. We have a cup of coffee and it's just like a little chat on the, on the, on the couch. Uh, and you get paid? <laughs> no, I didn't mention that now. <laughs> <laughs> It's always about money, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Super. So, yeah. John, have you another question for Paul? Paul, have you been over recently to watch Celtic? Um, obviously not the last few months, but would you been over in the last few years? Do you over to European games or anything? Yeah, I've been over. I went over to uh, Andrew. Do you know a fellow called Andrew Millish? He's from Drogheda. Andrew was the one that brings all the, the legends, you know, to different, yeah. different Q and A's and stuff. What do you do? Take a little trip off to him. Do you know what? I'll give you a good story about I went to Parkhead, me and my missus, 29th of November it was. And uh, what happened was it was a birthday, and I went off to uh, grab life by the balls by uh, John Hartson for his cancer uh, charity. Yeah. And we got tickets for the game and stuff and all that the next day, and uh, I couldn't get in because I wasn't wearing trousers. I had jeans <laughs> on me. He wouldn't let me in the players' lounge because I had jeans on me. <laughs> Unbelievable. Last fucking yeah. trip to Celtic Football Club. Did you not say, <laughs> do, you know, do you not know who I am? Well, I think you would recognise me when I was fucking 21, but you wouldn't recognise me now. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's a lot of people don't like corporate because of that. 
because you yeah. know you have to put your shirt and tie on and whatever and you know you'd rather just be more relaxed and chill oh, no, I, I just think you can't have a lot of scallywags in the one place so you must as well split them up and put yeah. them in the as well <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah that's basically you know that's you know i've always been a happy stupid guy but you know i'm very mentally strong and i, I love me football in time and now it's now I'm 40, 48 this year, and I still get I'm still involved through the radio, through Celtic and stuff like that. And it's it's just it's a big part of my life, and it's still great to be part of it. Brilliant. Who was your great. favorite footballer from your time at Celtic? Well, I mean, the favorite player I, that I played with would have been Paul McStay. Yes. But my favorite, my favorite footballer of all time would be Glenn Hoddle. Well, that's an unusual one. Now. Well, he was he was different yeah. gravy. If you if you it's like everything else, right? If you sit down and watch a DVD of Jimmy Johnson, you think wow. You watch one of Maradona, you think wow. Watch one of Bestie, you think wow. So it's just like you know, in the moment. But I played against Glenn. I've watched him since I was a, a, a child. What he achieved in his career, the man he became, England manager. I know he made a mistake by saying what he said, and, but at the end of the day, he's he was. I thought he was a superb footballer. Gazza is the same. There's loads of great footballers, you know, you're, you're Maradona's, yeah. you're Pelé's, you're the obvious ones, you're Messi's, you're Ronaldo's, you know, they're, they're all the obvious ones, but my one would have been, in, in, around my time, would have been Glenn Holland. Great pass out the ball, no doubt about that. Oh yeah, through the laces, can't be, zip it across the grass. Yeah, yeah. there's a re, there's reruns going on of different goals, obviously with no football, and he scored a goal, he ran 75 yards and touched the ball twice. I think he dropped the shoulder four or five times. It's an incredible goal. I, I, I remember playing against him at a, it was something similar. Uh, the I, I don't know what I, I don't know what a gym, right? I don't know what a gym. This is I'm talking about Glen Holland now. I'm not talking about Gaza, right? I'm talking about you. Hey, you you just got a great goal against the Mariner or somebody. I think one time. Yeah, come here, I can't even remember yesterday. Never mind. The <laughs> <laughs> your, your brain cells are gone, pal. Uh, no, no, no. But just what I, I remember, I remember like watching you know my dad coming in and saying, you know. Getting you up out of bed and you make him a cup of tea and you stand you have his few points on him and match of the day at start and he'd be saying, Watch this player and what's that player? And he used to always watch Glenn Huddle and then a couple of years later I was, I was sub against Spurs. Ozzy Ardelius was there and Glenn Huddle was there, Steve Perryman, Gary Mabbitt. And I'd come on against him and Huddle scored a goal. I think he went in the halfway line. I could have thought you were talking about dropped the shoulder twice, went to bend it into the into the sort of the right hand corner, dragged it onto his left foot and rolled it into the goal like and I stood there fucking clapping. <laughs> and the, 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 the fucking ground, the ground was packed. The ground was packed. So, yeah, you know, that's just, that, that was me, a silly young boy, I suppose. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Just living your dream. Yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. But then I went to the bar and fucked it all up. <laughs> <laughs> like many an Irish man before you. Yeah. Oh, come here. That's why I didn't feel so bad. Yeah. <laughs> if it was good enough for George Best, it was good enough for you. Oh, Jimmy, the, the, night that, the, night, the night that I, I was giving me trophies by Bestie, and uh, we ended up going for a point. I think there's a, a pub just across from the train station called The Boat. Years ago, it would have been, oh, it would have been, by the time I was playing the fire, just across the road, literally down off the bridge and around the back where all the boats were. There's a small little pub there in the corner, and we went in there. And I, was, I was in there for about, I think I missed my last train home, and we just got in the pub for the, next, the following day. And, and who walked in on the Alex Higgins and I thought, fuck, I'm never getting home now. Good times, good crack, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Any more questions, Johnny? Call you ran out. Do you know who you're thinking of? You're thinking of Paddy McCourt's goal against St. Mern. That's oh, right. right. And you'd have to be one tricky winger or the other. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. yes. But so, Come here, he had a lot more skill and pace than I had, let me tell you. <laughs> but you're here, do you know what? He had more problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, oh. if this is a regular feature of the show. Who would you take on a four ball, alive or dead? Ooh, fucking hell. Oh, Jesus. For the, ninth, for the 19th hole after. Hmm. Oh. Well, obviously, I have to, the ones I would have had a drink with personally. No, no, anyone in the world. Conor McGregor? 
Uh, no, he'd probably batter me after it. <laughs> <laughs> or give me a dig for not drinking his whiskey. Uh, oh, Jesus Christ. I'll take Steve Foster with me. There you are. I'll take Paul Key with me. <laughs> I'll take Gaza with me. Yeah. And I'll take the arresting officer with me to get me fucking out of the <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, Fantastic. Well, see, Steve crack. Foster got you into the gambling. See that man sitting down there with a glass yeah. of water? He got me into it. Uh, you yeah, got me? It's <laughs> not, do you know what? It's not good, mate. It's not good. Oh, hey, no. I still look at, I still look at a football bet now, and I'll have a little, a little bet with Gigi's too. So, look, at, come here. It's part of your life. You're not going to, come here. If I don't change now, I'm never going to change. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Anything else, sir, you want to tell about the Paul? No, obviously, we, we, we'll, we'll speak offline just regarding the homeless charity and the, the work that he's doing, and we, we'll get involved with the website column and the uh, company drinks, punish homes, and DHS and best, and hopefully maybe take a table at one of that dinner that he's doing. And, oh, that'd be well, great. Like, Listen, um, come we, here. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll be down, have a few pints, share, share a few more stories. Oh, if you get over, mate, the boys are great. John Hartson, Alan Thompson... You know, Jackie Mack can be over after he's a bit of a tone that he had. And Simon Donnelly, you know, Petrov, you have a few of them. Do you know what? And they're brilliant lads. And you'll have a great night, boys, I'll tell you. Well, sir, we're, and, we're definitely going. Oh, we're some, we, 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 we've got some great entertainment on the night. Eric Lawler's coming up. Jason Bourne's coming up. We've got a good ballot group. You know, it'll be a great day and a great night. You know, it really, really will. The game's six starts at two o'clock. We'll be finished back in the pub and all by four. Leave the pub quarter past six. Back to the hotel. Get changed. Dinner starts at quarter past eight. The rest of the history. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think the boys have already booked the table. Unfortunately, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to have to pay for it. <laughs> there, there's only one problem, Quinzer. Our, our wee boys are Celtic man as well. They'll have to come as well, but they're only... Oh, dear. No kids. No kids. <laughs> no kids. Well, listen, Paul, that was yeah. absolutely outstanding. And thanks no much for coming on. And thanks to John Quinn, the super fan as well. No problem, boys. Thanks for having me, Paul. Paul, Paul thank you keep, very much. Keep, Cheers, keep buddy. Thank you. Pleasure, mate. Bye-bye. Oh, All the best, lads. Thank bye. you. See you, sir. See you.